I'm going to talk to you on a really scary subject, uh, cybercrime. Right. But hopefully you'll learn a lot. You'll go away being scared. Uh, there's four seats at the front if you want to come sit down here. I will be picking on all of you, not individuals. Right. So this is me. Uh, my name is Steve Poole. I work for IBM. I work in a research lab in the UK. So we do all sorts of cool stuff. Most of the cool stuff that I do is Java related, JVMs, those sorts of things. But I've done other bits and pieces. And for two or three years recently, I stopped doing Java because I got a bit bored and I wanted to do something else. And I got the opportunity to lead a large IT team. And it was all about re-engineering the IT team for the future. And as part of that, I learned a lot about security, or rather I learned a lot about what we're not doing. And so a lot of this talk is going to be around those experiences, but also because I got interested, I went off and did a lot of research, a lot, talked to a lot of the IBM guys who do all these things and started to collect this information. Right, so that's what I'm going to give you. And I'm going to talk about realities, cybercrime, just how big it is. I'm going to talk about how we as developers aren't really good at dealing with it. We'll have a little bit about what a vulnerability might be, because that's a word that you've probably heard. Um, and we'll talk about what we can do to do better. Right? And then I'll sum up, and you can all leave feeling very chastened, and that you're going to go away and become much better individuals. Right? I want you to understand this this is the main takeaway. As developers, we're so used to not worrying about security, and we think it's other people's problem. But actually, it starts with us, and we're not doing enough. So as I said, um, I'm not a security officer, expert. I'm a developer. right? And one of the things that got me when I started working with these IT folk was they kept talking about compliance. Things have to be compliant. When you deliver an VM or you install something, it has to be compliant. And I went, compliance, why do I want to care about compliance? OK, and so I started digging into it. And I came away from it thinking, actually, we're really poor at what we need to do. And I learned that basically, if you give developers who aren't properly educated access to cloud resources, uh, bad things happen. For instance, there are so many times where we have seen developers being given access to Amazon or IBM Cloud or whatever, deploy some VM, and the next thing they know, their company's got a bill for a million dollars. Right? Because they didn't know how to secure it. We gave them access, they didn't know what to do. Right? But it's even bigger than that, because when you talk about other behavior changes. Right? So we have this conception that we know how strong things are. We know how robust your system is. And if you're talking to your execs, you're probably going, hey, I have a big, we have a fantastic application. We can do intrusion detection. We can, we've got strong encryption. We have firewalls. It's all fantastic. But we know that probably our application is a bit more like this. It's, we can check some intrusions. Um, we might have a firewall. We're not too sure what it does, but we have one. And we may even use HTTPS occasionally, which is just really scary. My point is, is if we do not get our act together, this is what your application is going to look like, right? It's going to be destroyed. So let's level set. Let's talk about why this is really important, the realities of the world. Now, you may think that the bad guys you know, we talk about the bad guy. Oh, it's some 16-year-old in his bedroom and he's hacking the FBI, right? They're lone hackers. That's all they do. And you might think that if you got hacked, you'd notice. It would be obvious that the wheels on your car would have been stolen, right? In software terms, you'd know, right? And also, you know that if you got a spam like this, okay, you would spot this, wouldn't you? Who would fall for this? Hands up. Yeah, I love this one because it says that I'm going to get, thank you, I will get a check for half a million dollars and an Apple laptop. 
So that's how, you know, that's an Apple laptop is obviously very valuable to be on that sentence. You're not going to fall for that, are you? Okay. The truth is that it's scary. So you may not be able to see this. It's a bit fuzzy. But let's just talk about this. $2,500 is the average loss from a burglar in the U.S. The largest bank robbery in the U.S. history, $30 million. The annual cost of cybercrime to the global economy in 2016, $445 billion. 80% of cyber attacks are organized. That's a word to take away, organized. 2016, $445 billion. In 2013, the drug trade, the illicit drug trade, was excised at $435 billion. Now, it's hard to assess these numbers. As you imagine, you can't really go around to your local drug dealer and say, how much money do you make? Um, but you can assess, right? And it's the same with cybercrime. Right? This is 2016, this is 2013. This is hardly growing. This is growing fantastically. Right? Which one has the least risk to the criminal? Guess which one is growing the fastest? And guess which one is the hardest to prosecute? Cybercrime. Cybercrime is predicted to be $2,100 billion, $2100 billion by 2019. Right? That's 3%. 3% of the world's economy, right? And it's still growing, right? And here's an example of some cybercrime. Anybody know what this is? Yeah, anybody? Did anybody know anybody who got one of these? Yeah, okay. Right, so this is what you get. Sorry? It's ransomware, yes. This is a thing called WannaCry, whoops. Right, which you may have heard about in the press recently. What did WannaCry do? It got onto your system and encrypted all of some of your data, ransom attack. Uh, last time we checked, 250,000 computers were hacked, right? It encrypts your data, dunk. And then it asks you to give them some money, and they are, it asks you to give some money in Bitcoin so it can't trace you back. The consequence of this running, as you can see, took out uh, the UK National Health Service got impacted, India closed down all their ATMs. Nissan Renault halted car production systems because it got in and encrypted machines that were involved in use for production. Right? These guys, somebody reached out to them and said, how much money did you make from this? And they told them, $85,000. $3 per machine, right? $85,000. So what about the rest of the $450 million? Right. This is just one example of this chaos being caused for $85,000. Right. This is happening worldwide. Yes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Right. So... Oh, you're right. I'll add more zeros. Thank you. So who are the bad guys? Uh, it's not these guys. These are just... These are 1920s villains, I think, just some random people, right? They're obviously cyber criminists, right? So the first thing you've got to remember is, is that they're like you. They're not guys sitting in a room. They are organized. They're organized like startups. They employ developers. They employ developers. They're in innovating. They are really good at hacking your systems, at becoming creative, right? They share all the information they have. For money, obviously, right? They're very, very goal focused, as you can imagine. Profits sharing in this sort of thing is, is you know, it's really good. You make a lot of money out of it. And they're 35 ish, right? They're already into crime. The really scary thing is, is that most of the guys here that we talk about aren't developers gone bad, <laughs> though there are some of those. They're actually guys who are already in crime, who went and learned how to write code. So some of them might be in this room or in this conference because they go off and learn. How do I learn? They go off and learn what they need to learn, latest stuff, and they turn it against us, right? So the, I mean, some quotes there, but basically we know that when we catch them, 
Most of them are caught for something other than cybercrime. They're caught for stealing cars or bank robbery or whatever you want. And then when they're rolled up, it turns out they're doing cybercrime, right? They hardly ever get caught for cybercrime, right? And they're hard to prosecute. How do you prosecute somebody for doing a crime in the US if they're in, I don't know, Indonesia or something? It's almost impossible, right? So they make loads of money and for almost no risk. And we make it easy for them. So what do we do? Um, well, let's talk about what they're after. So they're after things, you might go there just after credit cards, but that's sort of old hat. Ransomware is great because of Bitcoin, but they want identities. They want information about you. They want your medical data. They want your national insurance numbers or whatever it is that identifies you to your country and to your health systems because that lets them buy drugs. Right? They can sell that information. But information they gain from you, they can join together. Right? They want facts. They want to know little tiny bits, like your email address. Why would that be bad? What about at your date of birth? So we're developers, so how many here uh, have bought something off Steam, say? You know, we've all, we all go off and do these things. And occasionally it'll come up and it'll say, if you want to watch a video, it'll say, hey, put your date of birth in, because it's you know, a violent video or something. You know? And so you do. If you've put your real date of birth in, then stupid, because if that gets hacked, that data, your email address, I know you. That information, I can find out where you live, I can find out who you work for. If, you, if you're on Facebook and you say, hey, I'm going back to the office, and you say who you work for, they've got that information. Maybe you start moaning about your boss because he's not very nice and he stresses you out. That's valuable information, right? And of course, any sites that you visited. If I've got the right sets of data, I can join them together. I can go to Ancestry.com. I can find your mother's maiden name. So that's a security question I can pick up on. I can go to Facebook and see what the name of your, of your pet is, because that's another one. We share this information freely, and it gets hacked and used against us. Right? The more I know about you, the more I can focus my attack on you, individually, personally. And that's what's happening. Right? Because it's not just technical stuff. It's this stuff. Social engineering. So we know that we wouldn't fall for any more of these phishing ones. I, I love this one. You know, your ATM card of ten point half, ten and a half million dollars was returned because you didn't accept it. Do you want it back? You know, it's like yeah. Or this one. This is just great. Um, this one says things like um, officials who almost held the fund to themselves for their selfish reason. You know, from the was it director of the FBI? It's like, yeah, yeah, we never, nobody's going to fall for that, are we? Right. But maybe you might get something along these lines. Maybe it says your boss tells you to do something that involves spending money, and maybe this guy says, "I oh, look, I'm going to the golf course. Don't talk to me." And maybe this guy is not somebody you want to second guess because you don't want the grief. And that's because maybe I figured out from Facebook or wherever that that's the relationship with your boss. So if I send this to you, you might action it. That happens a lot. It might be that I target you or somebody in your company in a different way. Maybe I'm targeting the really busy guys, the non-tech savvy guys. What am I after? Well, I know. Here's the other scary thing. The su these guys, the bad guys, they are more industry aware than you are. So they know how an industry, an industry works. They're tech savvy, they're industry savvy. That means they can craft social engineering attacks designed to get past all your defenses because they know what words to use. They know how it works. And if you're not tech savvy, then things like, oh, run this, open this way bill in a zip, da -da, you've installed malware. This is real. Right. The point is this stuff is coming down the pipe. More organized, right? More focused. And the thing is, all that spam that you get, which you just go laugh, laugh, laugh. Well, the guys who are creating that, they're not after you. If I'm trying to extort money from you or just extract money from you by you making, I'm looking for the gullible people. I'm not going to go after the people who are not gullible, am I? I'm going to write something. The fact is, if I send you a fish that that's that gullible, and you accept it, 
That's the people I'm after. I'm not after you. If I'm after you, I'm going to do something much more sophisticated that you're not going to fall for, that you're going to fall for. Right? And everything about you that I can find helps me craft that attack. Right? And as I said, depending on what we know about you, we might go for middle-level execs, people are afraid of their bosses, uh, new joiners, hey, I've just joined this new company. Request comes in. Make ask you to do something. And you go, okay, then that sounds fine, right? Uh, you're too busy, or actually, maybe I figured out that you don't like working for that company, so maybe I'll just come and visit you and say, hey, do you want to make some money, right? And they love us, developers. We are a target audience. The reason that we're target audience is because we know how the infrastructure works. We know how the code works. We write the code. We tend to have better privileges than anybody else, right? And we trust people, right? Everybody in this room who's a developer, right, trust people more than they should do. How many of you have done, I don't know, app get install? I know, some of you, or NPM install. Yeah, yeah, okay. So we'll come to that in a sec, right? Right? We are ignore we ignore security matters, right? And we just use stuff, right? I say on these slides, the bad guys prey on the weak, the vulnerable, and ignorant. And I say that's you, us. And if you don't agree, uh, how many of you ever Googled for things like this? How many of you Googled for getting Java to accept all certs over HTTPS? <laughs> how to disable certificate validation? How to trust an SS? Right? We've all done it. We've all sat there and gone, how do, uh, I can't figure out how to configure this software. How do I turn it off? We do that, right? And if you're Java programmers, you may even have written things like this. New trust manager. So if you're not a Java programmer, it's a <laughs> Java joke, right? But basically, it's a definition that gets called, and it says, return true, return true. Trust everything, <laughs> right? OK, so you think that's funny? This stuff is in real code that you're using, right? You know, we do this stuff, right? Well, we do this, blah, blah, blah. We do it all the time. How hard can it be? Well, I Googled. Well, I went to GitHub, and I did a code search. Implements Trust Manager. And this is early this year, and what did I get? 72,000 hits. Some classic names. Real code. Over-trusting trust provider. Accepting trust manager. A very friendly accepting trust manager. Allows anything through, right? A trusting, a very trusting trust manager that accepts anything, right? <laughs> right. Install the all trusting trust manager. Okay, this is in code that people are writing that you're using. Right? It's all sitting on all these wonderful repositories. This is not just Java, all programming languages have this. Right? The point is, NPM for instance, I mean I'm not picking NPM because they're all the same. There's a whole good reason for it to share. Let people make great use of our code, and it's great. But we don't check. Okay? Many of you, if you work, you know, working for a company, you will have rules about licensing. Can I use this code? What license is it under? Oh, that's acceptable. That's not acceptable. But nobody ever checks the providence. Where does this code come from? Do I have any signs that this guy is doing something unusual? Is it just a GitHub repository with nothing around it? What providence do you checking do you do to see whether the person creating this code right, is not shady? Right? And the thing is, our attitudes to this percolate up. Right? So look, this is just something that came in at the weekend. This is a tweet tweeter by an, an IBA, a UK employee. Right. She was responding to, uh, an to a uh, statement by somebody else. She said, my staff log on to my computer on my desk with my login every day, including interns on exchange programs. Right. Now, as you can imagine, that hasn't gone down too well in the UK. Right. But it's our fault because we make that possible and necessary. And the bad thing is, is that because that comes out, anybody who works for her potentially could be a target, right? Because if I can get into their account, they may be able to find out that password and then I can pretend to be an MP, right? It's not about what secrets she might know. 
It's the fact that I can impersonate her. So think about things like you're a small company and you proudly put up on your website the companies that you work for. for. You know, you've done deals with these things. You've done fantastic things. You could be targeted because you've said that. Because if I can get into your email accounts and I can pretend to be you, then I can communicate with those companies as you. And I've already reduced, I've already reduced the trust barrier because they're going, oh, yeah, it's from that guy I spoke to. Right? It's our lack of understanding about what the bad guys are doing and our lack of understanding of how we should be preventing it that is letting this happen. Are you still paying attention? It gets scarier. You think it was bad? Oh, no. No, no, no. It gets much worse. So we're going to talk about how they attack us beyond social engineering. We're going to talk about code and things. So I've talked about social engineering. So that's asking you to let me in. Vulnerability exploits, which is the classic, which is all the things you hear about. There's a bug in the code somewhere or a feature or something. And people have figured out how to wire different bits of code together to create a vulnerability, like the WannaCry stuff. Okay? It's just a way of getting delivery of stuff. Right? And of course, the bad stuff, which is I pay you and you tell me. Right? But they're already there. You know, this stuff, they're already into the system. But they're doing more. Devices. <sighs> devices. Everybody is adding devices to their system. Right? I'm going to talk about some of this stuff in a minute, about default passwords. So we'll talk about devices. Ransomware we've covered. Blackmail. Okay. Extending malware. That's worth pointing out. How do they get malware to onto into systems? Well, huh, you go and take it, you go and download it. Sometimes it's a very specifically crafted payload. That's all it does. Other times, they are sticking it in places where you go, like Docker images. How do you know that that Docker image that you've pulled down, that's on Docker Hub, that says, hey, I've got a great implementation of this thing, and it's all easy to use, and it's all wrapped up, and you go, thank you very much. And then you install it, and it says, oh, mount your home directory, or mount the root directory of your file system. And you go, OK, then. And now you've just let some code that you've downloaded off the web run and have full root access to your system. Right? You might be buying it, like game trainers or things. There's all these things where once you pay money for something, you trust it. Right? And classics like people trying to convince you, if you are, say, you've got some open source, maybe I'll give you a fix. And you go, thank you very much. But you don't pay too much attention to it, and you don't realize that, in fact, you've opened up a little tiny vulnerability. Right? And then things like unhelpful people, helpful people who turn up and go, yeah, I'll do all those Git merges for you, right? And you just let them do it. You don't look at what they do because you're taking two sets of changes, put it together, how hard can it be? If you don't pay attention, opportunities for people add things you weren't expecting. But one of the biggest new things, well, it's just growing, is the number of machines that we're adding to the network. So smart printers, TVs, Raspberry Pis, phones. Lots of them have these things, system on a chip, so a full Linux implementation. Right? These things ship with default passes. What's the chances that you ever even thought about going to your smart TV and trying to figure out how to change the root password? Right? You probably even know how to access it. Right? Um, and how about patching it if it's got vulnerabilities? How would you do that? But we let these systems on. Right. You have to accept, and I'll tell you a horrible, scary story about TVs soon. You have to accept that your internal network is not secure because you're letting devices in that you can't maintain securely. Right. So let me just change tack and talk about something else. It's really, it'll be relevant. How safe is your interaction with the web? One of the things that we do is we go to the web without any thought. Browser makes a request to a website, comes back, and there's a gateway in the middle. Don't even think about it, right? And you make these requests, browser, through the gateway, okay? And somebody says to you, you shouldn't be using HTTP because the data's flowing in the clear. So if there was a bad gateway, somebody could steal my data. So you say, oh, I'll use HTTPS. And you think life is great. But believe me, I have ways of hacking that. 
right? I have ways of getting, uh, making, breaking your HTTPS connection, right? It's really easy, right? So the first thing I'll do is I'll get you to accept a certificate. And we do this all the time. You connect to a gateway, you're in a hotel, and it pops up and it says, oh, a certificate. And you go, oh, gosh, you look at this stuff, and you go, no idea, accept. <laughs> yeah, we do, we do, right? right? Okay, well, at least you saw it happen, right? Um, the other thing is um, maybe your company has given you a laptop with a browser on it, and it's got a bunch of uh, certificates in it because then you can connect to internal applications. But what happens if the root certificate has been stolen? I can generate certificates that you'll accept, right? I might have a bogus one in there because I've accessed your system, right? That's quite sophisticated. But there's an easy, even easier way. If the first request you make to, uh, the first data that comes from a website is HTTP, even if it contains links to HTTPS, I can hack you. So I have pictures for this and have lots of words, but let's just, let's see if we can talk it through. Let's do the pictures. Imagine this. So here's this unhappy person, HTTP request. Imagine you're going to, this is a landing page, HTTP request, and on that page that comes back, there will be a login page where you're going to put user ID and password, right? And inside that HTTP data, uh, there's a post, and the post says HTTPS is where you're going to send the result data. What happens is, is the middleman here just scrapes that out, drops the S, gives it back to you, you fill in the data, you post it. I've now posted my private data in the clear, so it doesn't even have to de-encrypt it. This guy steals it, sends you back a, oh sorry, server's temporary unavailable. Yeah, Refresh. This guy's out your way, you post your data, you didn't notice. Right? And I think that's basically what I said there. Yeah, right. So you're gonna say, I don't do that. I don't connect to bogus Wi-Fi's, do I? How would I why would I do that? Right. They're everywhere. How do you know that the SSID that you're connecting to is the one that you should? Right? In your office, yeah, maybe in your home, in a coffee shop. How about if you're in some conference in Poland and you've connected to an SSID that somebody gave you and somebody gave you a password? At least here, the password is on a piece of paper. I've gone to conferences where the password is slapped on the wall. Everyone knows what it is. Right? And you think that the SSID that you see, that you connect to, is the one provided by this by the conference. How do you know? How do you know it's not something like this? I built this. It's so it's a bit old. Uh, Raspberry Pi with a Wi-Fi dongle. Now I can do Raspberry Pi Ws, a power pack, a little grey box that I sit under your seat or I sit against the wall, right? And I can force you to connect to it. Wi-Fi the Protocols allow people to force you to renegotiate, and I can bring you through to my, my um, little Raspberry Pi. How would you know? Right? They're everywhere. Now, and most of them do stupid things like this. They ask you to do bad practices. Right? Wherever you go, right, they're everywhere. Right? We, we can't live without Wi-Fi, right? and we just do what they say to get stuff in. Right? So this is what I find really strange, right? We know that this is really bad behavior. We still do it. We know we should be doing the right sort of encryption, right? We know. And then yet, we do things like this. We turn it off. Wget, no check, cool, insecure. Sudo apt-get, allow unauthenticated. We do it all the time because it's easy, right? And when I start asking people why they do this, I get interesting, interesting ones. The server I access is self-signed. That's the most obvious one. My company has, has created a self-signed one. Oh, gosh, isn't it so hard to get, this proper, to get a proper certificate, right? And then they say, well, one of the servers I have is self-signed and the others isn't. But I want to talk to both different ones, so I'll just turn it off because it seems easier, right? And then things like, well, I thought I was using the tool correctly. We have tools for sure that are... Uh, sometimes complicated to understand, right? And I trusted the tool to do the right thing. 
Okay, we're good at this, aren't we? Right? And then someone changed the script, and I don't know why. So this is, an, this is a beef with the ops guys. Right? Many, many IT shops have all these fantastic scripts for doing things, and they don't put them on the change control. So when they get changed, they have no idea why. Right? It's beef. Right? And of course, we download code. We do it all the time. Right? We just believe people are trustworthy. So um, there was this wonderful thing not that long ago with this nice guy who had produced, uh, I think it was 11, was it a small piece of function? It turned out the whole of the node system was dependent on this. Everybody used it. And he withdrew it. And it broke everybody. Right? Think about this, though. There's this guy who everybody's depending on. What happens if that guy had put some bad code in? You just go, yeah, fine. I trust him. You don't check. Right? And I don't know why we aren't taking this seriously. Sometimes I think it's because we think this has got some cachet, some romance, that this is what, you know, cybercrime, yes. But actually, it's not really called that. They're all, they call it advanced persistent threat. And that's because of all the things they do. They're innovative. They're imaginative. They're well-funded, ruthless, uncaring. These guys are out to get you. They're out to get us all. Right? They don't care. They make large amounts of money at it, and they use our weapons against us. Right? So let me tell you a little story. How many people have seen Ocean's 13? I mean, most of you. Well, OK. If you haven't, it's a good movie. So there's this piece in Ocean's 13 where they want to influence the dice that are going to be thrown in a casino. They're going to put some little magnets in or something so they can make them twitch. So how do they do that? They go all the way back to the factory in Mexico where they're created so that when they turn up, they're f they look great, right? They're all wrapped up. How about this? Suppose, suppose they had to get into a smart TV factory. Suppose what they had to do was go and find one of these chips and hack it. That would be cool, wouldn't it? That'd be a great story, right? Well, the trouble is, it's already happened. I did this talk year or so ago, and this guy came up to me and told me a story, which is why that's on here. And I did the talk again, and somebody said, that happened to me too. So let me talk about this. TV on the wall. You don't think about it. So this is a real, true story. And I said, two people have told me, variations. Large company, have a, have a factory in the middle of nowhere in the US, uh, buy a smart TV. Comes with an ethernet cable, that's what they care about. They plug it in, and they use it, and it's great. And then they discover that they have a new SSID. Just popped up, new Wi-Fi gateway. They can't imagine where it's coming from. I mean, no, no idea. And just because they were tenacious, they figured out it was to do with the TV that was on the wall. Turn the TV off, goes away, turn it on, comes back. This is suspicious. So they're an engineering company, so they try and get to the bottom of it. They phone up, or they reach out to the manufacturer of the TV, and they go, why's your TV got uh, a Wi-Fi, and how do we disable it? And they go, the TVs don't come with Wi-Fi. They've just got an Ethernet port. So they start digging, and they take it apart, and yep, the chip has got a Wi-Fi. It gets even worse, though, because they work out what this thing is doing. When you turn it on, it creates a Wi-Fi gateway. So now they've produced a bridge from the Ethernet gateway to the outside world. And it phones home. It sends a location address, which you can do with IP, basically where I, base, basically where I am, to some server. So now what that means is, when they turn this TV on, this Wi-Fi gateway is broadcasting out Somebody, and they've told where you are, somebody turns up, drives up, now has full access to your network. Right? That's what happens. And to make it even more bitter, the system on a chip that you see in there which has Wi-Fi on it, nobody knows where it came from, right? We don't know whether it was hacked at the factory or what. Might, but it's possible that even the factory didn't know that that chip had Wi-Fi capabilities because they come as discrete units. Maybe they didn't check, right? Pretty bad, right? And the thing to take about Wi-Fi is the 
biggest thing about Wi-Fi is it's everywhere. And we as developers tend to think that it stops at the wall. Right? But the fact is, any Wi-Fi that you connect to, wherever it is, doesn't necessarily mean it's yours. Right, right so let's look at some software. We need to talk about vulnerabilities, and I'll talk about some of the positive sides. So vulnerabilities, the main thing to take away about vulnerabilities is, is a continuing arm race to find them. These guys are out to find them. We have these researchers who are trying to find them. Everybody's trying to find them. Because as soon as we find them, we can fix them. And if we fix them, you, you apply the fix, and then we're done. Right. And you can go to websites. Right? They're called CVEs. CVE website, you can go to there, and you can go get lists of these things. This is the way, it's not the only way, but it's the general way of finding out about vulnerabilities in any software you're using. And it's the numbers that you'll be scanning for, and you'll be told about whether they get fixed. Um, and I think it was a few days ago I did the scans and said, how many are there for Java? How many for JavaScript? There's always lots. And the thing about these vulnerabilities is that we're not going to tell you much about what's in them because that would be wrong. Why would I tell you the inside of these things? That's the same as me or you tweeting credit card and PIN number. Right? You're not going to do that. You're not going to give away the keys. So we're not going to talk about the internals. But we're going to score them and we're going to let you understand how you can assess the vulnerability. Right? So these are the things that you should be looking for. Right? Because if you, you need to understand about assessing the vulnerabilities and the impact of the software that you're using. Right? The first thing is if you start downloading software, go see what vulnerabilities it's got. Right? And vulnerabilities can be not what you expect. So this code, um, that URL is the only time I'm ever going to share uh, the details of vulnerability because somebody took it apart. Normally we won't share. But this one here, this piece up here, Content type. So this is um, a GET request, right, with some gobbledygook in. And Apache struts at the bottom of this. And Apache struts, what it does is it goes, can I find content type? Can I find multi-part form data in it? And it says, yes, I can. So it does that. And it tries to parse the data because it expects it to be in that data. And it fails. And as part of the failure, part of the failure, creating the exception message to turn back, uh, it calls this OGNL parser. That isn't gobbledygook. It's a programming language called OGNL. And what that does, as part of the parsing, it gets executed. And the execution ends up in Java, Lang, runtime, get runtime, exec, something. Right? And the thing is, you don't have, there's no security on this. I'm just putting a, I'm just talking to your server. I'm just doing a get without details in. Boom, you run that code. This is the Equifax um, problem you've probably heard about. It was that trivial to get servers with that vulnerability to do things. And that came out of a piece of code where somebody was trying to be helpful to feedback some error messages. Right? Vulnerabilities don't have big smoking guns. They're just... Vulnerabilities, they're just places where we did things and we didn't think about the consequences. Right. right. So <laughs> I'm going to talk uh, about how you can prevent some of this stuff. Right. But I want you to realize right, there's a whole bunch of fundamentals that we ignore. Right. IT guys will throw rocks at you for not thinking about it. Right. But there we are. Validation, encryption. Right. We weaken this. We do things all the time where we help the IT guys in the wrong way by reducing the effectiveness of the actions that they take because we are not aware of it. Right? We were ignorant. Now you're not ignorant. Now you're beginning to wake up to the scale of the problem and the challenges. And so much of this comes from our ignorance that we have to change. Right? So how would you fix this? So the very first thing is you've got to keep current. This is the thing that people go, oh, I can't do that. I can't go to my boss and tell them that they have to apply fixes. Right? Bad thing, because if I apply a fix, I destable my system. But basically, if you don't do that, 
then you've got vulnerabilities, right? Every vulnerability you have is a gateway in. And if somebody can find that you've got a vulnerability, and they can do that in some ways about finding out what versions you're running for things, right? It's not vulnerabilities in your code, it's some vulnerabilities of the dependencies that you've installed, the Docker files that you, the uh, images that you extended. If I know you've got one of those, if I can find that out, and bearing in mind, you look at what WannaCry showed you about how easy it is to get on your system. I have lots of examples where I can find all sorts of information about your system that you weren't expecting to give back, right? So that's the first thing, is you have to convince people the benefit. And we have some mitigations for how you make that less impactful. And we have to start thinking about how we structure applications so that they're more compartmentalized, so that access control is more about specific sets of data than having everything. It's like bulkheads in a ship, right? And you've got to think about intrusion and helpfulness. Every time that you do something that helps your neighbor, or you have, every time you, work, you design something that's more flexible, you go, oh, we'll do that. That'll be really flexible for the future. Think hard about the downsides. Right? Because everything we do to make your li our lives easier helps them. Right? So you can start doing things like start building your own caches repositories. Right? Start scanning them. There are tools out there to let you understand what vulnerabilities you've got in the soft, the code that you're using. You can buy the service. You, you, you know, Docker images get scanned on Docker Hub. Um, everybody is producing this stuff to help you understand the level of exposure from a vulnerability point of view, right? But every time that you download something without thinking about it, right, then you weaken it. What are the people who are providing the code telling you about how they're ensuring that their code is secure and is not subject to vulnerabilities? Do they have processes for you doing this? Do they tell you what they do? Right? Right? Educate yourself. There's a whole bunch of tools and, and things out there that you can learn about how to write better secure software. Right? You can go to this place, cwe.mitre.org, where there's a whole list of ways of not writing good code and ways of writing good, good code. Lots of examples of all sorts of programming languages. Right? You get examples like this. Um, verify admin. If string come on password, password is mu, let people in or something. You know, bad anti-patterns and then good patterns. So this the information is out there to educate yourself on how you should be thinking about how you write code. Right? Right. And there's the main page for this. They call this thing seven pernicious kingdoms. There's the seven, which is basically the seven ways that people normally get into your system. Um, you know, things like not you don't validate data, uh, you have f um, poor API designs, etc. Right? If you're a Java programmer and you don't sleep at night, you can go read um, the Java SE security code. This is fully detailed. Right? This has got lots and lots of really good information about how you should write good code. It's just very dry. But if you're a Java programmer and if you haven't even looked at this, then now is the time to go have a good look. Right. There are analysis tools out there. This is LGTPM. This is a cool one. This is one that you can connect your, if you've got open source GitHub repositories, you can connect this tool and it starts to let you know. It's doing scanning, right? So it's looking for your code and trying to help you. Now, it's not perfect, but it's out there, and there are other tools that can do that, that help you as well. So there are things like security, like find bugs. This is another little great tool, same sort of thing. It's a plugin. It's trying to figure out what code patterns you are good or bad and trying to help you understand. The tools are out there for you to use if you go out and start looking forward for them. And there are people writing good documentation, Good presentation. This is just Owen. Owen Woods has got a really cool one, helping you understand how to manage the risk, trying to understand uh, more about the whole structure of the problem. Right, right. Because how do you fix the problem if you don't know where to start? So I can teach you. We can teach you what your coding should be. Right. But there are other ways of thinking about it so that you can ensure you have a good, secure design. Right. 
Right. And then online guides. Well, OWASP is an open source project, if that's the right word, it's an open source community, where again, they're trying to assess what it is that people do to get into systems and trying to share that information with you. Right. And you can see the you know, top 10 for 2017, injection. Injection is always the biggest one. Right, so that's you know simple things like SQL injection and others, and then all sorts of interesting ways of breaking parsing to get into your system. Right. So this all may seem pretty expensive, right? And to a degree, it is expensive. But I think if you got from the beginning of this, just how large the problem is, it may not be knocking at your door today. You may not realise it, but it's coming. Lots and lots of people are being hacked, right? We are starting to design better systems, and that's sort of by happenstance, not because we went, oh, this is a good way of dealing with cybercrime. Uh, so we do microservices. Microservices are a great way of structuring compartmentalization because you're building small services, right? And because of that, you're probably into a lot of continuous delivery. So you're beginning to build automation stories for delivering code and testing those code. So if you can do that, you can start adding in uh, checks for applying vulner vulnerabilities. So you can put fixes to a vulnerability and start driving those through your continuous delivery process to see whether you're causing any problems, right? Um, containers are great with dependency management, again, because you can encapsulate it. You're not doing app get install stuff. One of the things that people go, go oh, I know what my dependencies are. And you go, well, actually, no, you know your first level dependencies because you wrote them in the file. But you don't know what those things are dependent on, and on, and on, and on. Right. Uh, infrastructure as code, yes, again, really valuable, because it's allowing you to put your s the infrastructure code in source repositories and manage it. Right. And again, DevOps is really good, because it's letting us get educated by some of these problems. Right. And moving to the cloud right, is letting you start to use people who are providing professional services for a more, a more economically use that. If you're deploying to Amazon or IBM Cloud or whatever, everybody has services in terms of uh, better access control, firewalling, uh, vulnerability management, etc. Right? They're out there to help you. Right? So the recap on all this is we are in a war. Oh, war. We may not realize this, but they're out to get us. Right? And because we're not fully cognizant of how they're going to do it, right? We're on the back foot. They're out to get us. Everybody is vulnerable. Because we're not aware, and even if we are aware, we're not really understanding how our behavior is making things worse. So we have to change our behavior. We have to do things differently. We have to take care and think about the design consequences and coding consequences or actions from a security point of view, right? And we've got to take that up the chain so that we've got to tell people sharing passwords is a bad thing to do, right? It's your problem. If we don't get it right, right, we can't assume that our users will understand. If we don't take it seriously and we give them poor solutions so that they only, they only have certain choices to get their job done, then that's our fault, right? The good news is, as I've said, we know how to fix this. It's just us starting to get our act together. It's a long tunnel. There is light at the end of it. Thank you. <laughs>